Thank you everyone for coming on time to the first event in our new speaker series, Dialogues in European Jane Studies. I'm Dr. Christopher Jane Miller, and I'm joined by my collaborators here from the University of Birmingham and Ghent University, who you will hear from in just a moment. On this auspicious day of Gandhi's birthday, we welcome you. And I just briefly wanted to show you our website so that you understand how it works and so that you can come to future events. This is our homepage here. And as you see, it has the event that is most recent. But if you go to see future events down here, you'll be able to get into our future dates and you can see that all the information for our future talks, which will take place on basically the first Monday of every month are now here. So you can read about who those people are, what those talks are, what the different themes are, and you can also register here. We will have registration links here, probably by the end of the event, I'm told today. So you'll be able to just go right in there and register for each of these individual webinars. And if you can't attend, you can still register because we will be putting the recordings up for later viewing. So with that being said, I would like to now hand over the mic to my colleague, Marie Lane Gorse at University of Birmingham, who is going to introduce our new speakers series to you. So thank you very much, Chris. And thank you all of you for being here today. That's exciting to see how many people there is. Always so good to see how vibrant uh, this community of people sharing a common interest in China studies is. So today, um, as Chris told you, I'm quite excited to introduce this new series um, with him and with Tina. And I would like to use the next two minutes or maybe three uh, to give you a, a bit of perspective on, on, on why we did that. So first of all, as you all know, Jaina studies is an extremely quickly growing field of studies. So much growing that in the last couple of years, it has at times even become hard for us scholars in giant studies to attend all the events that are scheduled. So why add one more? May you rightly be tempted to say, to ask. So while it appeared to us that precisely given such a growth and because more and more young scholars are working on Jainism, and because more and more scholars with another specialty also develop an interest in giant topics, it was time to develop more recognizable research networks where interested parties could easily find who researches on which specific topic and where. So this lecture series is just a very first step uh, in the implementation of this vision. So then we are all based in Europe. So it was especially clear to us how this need was felt around us. Uh, indeed, a very diverse body of institutions in which scholarship in Jainism can be pursued is to be found in Europe. So to start with very briefly, the three of us are from an institution where people can develop research on Jain studies or even can follow a whole study pathway leading to scholarship in Jainism. Uh, and to do so as part of a research environment in this specific field. So that, that's quite exciting to, to have so many centers on that. So first of all, Ghent University, where no need to present it, uh, teaching and research in China studies are developed for many decades. Uh, and today the focus is more on both pre-modern and on modern languages and culture, notably with uh, Eva de Klerk and with Tina Weckmans here. Then, the more recent and already thriving uh, Ari Hunt Institute with Chris Miller has now a full master program in engaged giant studies. And finally, the newly born Dharmanat Research Network at the University of Birmingham with myself as a representative, um, where especially topics in philosophy and in religious studies uh, are developed. And as you know, so many other places ranging from both departments uh, or research institutes of South Asian studies to departments of philosophy, literature, political sciences, history, or religious studies. So many places across Europe where people can learn and collaborate around giant studies. And the speakers in this series will hopefully reflect a bit of this uh, diversity. And starting with SOAS uh, and Hamburg this evening. So, but before, before I give the floor to uh, tonight's speakers, one important rationale behind this lecture series that I wanted to stress is its dialogical form. One of the most important phenomena that accompanies the current growth of scholarship in Jainism uh, in, is in our eyes, the constitution of collaborative networks in sub-disciplines, such as, for example, Jain narratives or recently Jaina philosophy. 
people take the step of securing common projects and regular meetings that not only help them grow as scholar, but also promote research in these subfields in very new and exciting ways. So recognizing the fact that an important future step for us is to work more and more in organized subfields, one aim of this series is also to contribute uh, to kindling these dialogues. So final word that we uh, is that we intend the very last session in May to be a discussion on the future of China studies. So the diversity of topics and methodology, the formation of subdisciplinary um, groups of expertise to promote the subfields, the question of manuscript collections, uh, that of the position of teaching uh, Jainism in a diverse body of institutions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I hope that this is with these big questions in mind that we will all approach this new lecture series. And now uh, I let Tino introduce uh, today's specific plans. Thank you all again. Thank you, marie -Hélène. Um And uh, best greetings from Ghent in Belgium. Um, it is um, my job today to first very quickly just say that I share the excitement already expressed by my two uh, colleague organizers by the fact that we're all together here and that there has been a lot of positive vibes and interest um, in our um, series of dialogues. Um, but my main uh, task today is to present um, our MC, as we uh, decided to call this uh, function for tonight, Dr. Helene de Jong here, um, who is talking to us tonight from London, I assume. She's a lecturer in South Asian Religions and Philosophies at the Department of Religions um, and associate member of the Center for Jaina Studies at SOAS, University of London. Uh, now, I've known Helene for quite a while. I was lucky enough to be her colleague and witness her PhD research on um, Dharma Pariksha traditions in Jainism come together and bear fruit um, in the, what was it, between, from 2016 onwards. After finishing her PhD, she held um, research positions in Toronto and Chicago, and then now she is at SOAS. Um, although her work on Jainism has so far focused kind of on narrative traditions, about which we are pleased that she will also talk um, in our next dialogue session in November, she is really very versatile, and she's taught and written about a lot of different aspects of the Jain tradition. Um, the reason we asked her to preside, or MC, I still have to get used to that word, uh, over this first dialogue is because of her close involvement in the Pure Soul exhibition, which took place um, at SOAS um, between April and June um, this year. Um, she was involved in the volume that comes with that um, quite wonderful exhibition. Um, the aim of Pure Soul was to acquaint the wider public with the, what is called often the Jaina spiritual traditions, um, such as those that developed around and in the wake of Srimad Ratchandra and Kanji Swami. So without, uh, without further ado, I will hand over to Helene, um, who will introduce the speakers of this first dialogue, um, which is titled Adhyatma Movements, Sri Ratchandra and Kanji Swami. Helene, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Tine, um, for this honorific introduction. It's very kind. Uh, also, thank you, Chris and Maria Len, for, for inviting me. Uh, it's an honor to be a panelist of, of this session about uh, more modern uh, traditions or early modern traditions of, uh, of, um, of the pure soul, so Adhyatma traditions. Um, with uh, Corina Meloir and Corinne Smith. Um, Corina, I know uh, personally as well as, as a student uh, when I was guest lecturing uh, for Ghent University. Um, she finished her MA there uh, by now. She also finished an MA in yoga and meditation uh, from SOAS and is currently a PhD stu student at Hamburg University. Her research focuses on Srimad Raj Chandra, um, who of course was uh, an early modern thinker and, and guru uh, in the uh, mystical tradition. Corinne Smith is another uh, of my close colleagues uh, who is because she is a PhD student at SOAS um, under the supervision of Peter Flügel. 
and her research focuses on Kanji Swami and the Kanji Swami tradition. Um, but she also looks more broadly at uh, the philosophical tradition of Kunda Kunda and, and with that also of, um, of Raj, Srimad Raj Chandra. Um, she has also uh, collaborated on the production of a beautiful movie um, produced by Chouette Films um, on the Kanji Swami tradition, which um, is now or is going to be soon, I didn't check anymore, uh, online uh, available available to watch. Um, so uh, these two speakers will talk to you about uh, a specific uh, period or a specific trend. Um, Corina is going to talk to is going to talk to you about Shri Madhuraj Chandra, um, his philosophical or spiritual insights, philosophical ideas, but also how he brought the community together, um, what the role was of, of language in his in his uh, lineage, etc. And uh, Corinne is after that going to talk about uh, more philosophical ideas of uh, Sri Madhuraj Chandra and, and Kanji Swami. And both um, were located in Gujarat, so we also have a sort of geographical uh, uh, orientation of tonight's uh, papers. So with that, I want to hand over a uh, word now to Corinne. <laughs> Thank you very much, Eline, and it's great to see you and to see you all here. And uh, yeah, I'm very happy and honored to be the first one to uh, yeah to kick off this uh, <laughs> this event. And I will start with my presentation on uh, Srimad Raj Chandra and try to share my screen. Um, hopefully, this will work now. Okay, here we are. But uh, this is not the beginning. That I'm sorry about this. <laughs> All right, here we are. Um, the title of my presentation is Empowering Vernacular Identity, Exploring Srimad Raj Chandra's Impact on the Significance of Gujarati in Forming a Religious Community. And this presentation is my humble effort to explain the importance of the use of language, here in particular the use of a vernacular language, Gujarati, for the formation of the identity of a religious community. I will demonstrate this in taking a look at uh, quite some small parts of the writings of Sri Mat Raj Chandra, who was a Jain mystic and philosopher of the late 19th century in Gujarat. He is well known for his famous works on soul and self-realization in the Jain communities. And he was a prominent figure that was born during a period of transformative change, marked by challenges posed by British rule and the intensifying competition among Hindu, Muslim and Christian influences within society. In response, Jain communities and sects embarked on endeavors to unify their members under a shared Jain belief system that could resonate universally. Um, I have been inspired uh, to do this research on Srimad Raj Chandra uh, during a visit to the Srimad Raj Chandra Ashram in Dharampur in 2019. And the guru of this uh, of this ashram, Puja Guru Devsuri Rakesh Ji, has done uh, research on um, on the Atma Siddhi, the Atma Siddhi Shastra, one of the most famous works of uh, Srimad Raj Chandra. He was even awarded a PhD on his re uh, on his research, and you find lots of material on Srimad Raj Chandra in this ashram. Most of the pictures that I've used for this presentation have been taken by me at this ashram. So what will you expect today? I will talk briefly about Jainism and language, focusing on Jains and Gujarat, and then bore you a little bit with the, the history of language and Jain identity, closing with uh, some remarks on the Gujarati language, and then uh, come and focus on the life and impact of Srimad Raj Chandra, giving you a very brief introduction to the Atma Siddhi Chastra, uh, read two verses of this work to you. Have a look at Srimad Raj Chandra's contemporaries, one of which is, of course, the very well-known Mahatma Gandhi. And uh, then uh, close my presentation in focusing on the global influence of Srimad Raj Chandra. And if time allows, give you a small postscript on why did Srimad Raj Chandra write in Gujarati. 
Okay, but I want to start my uh, presentation in quoting John Cord, who has once said in that we see that nearly every social and cultural development in South Asian history is reflected in the Jain tradition. And even more importantly, we see that the Jains were not merely passive receivers of these developments, but instead they were active participants in creating and changing South Asian history. So, but what are we talking about today? We are talking about the Adyatma movement. What is the Adyatma movement? Adyatma can be translated as relating to the soul or pertaining to the self. And the roots of this movement go back to the great Jain philosopher Kunda Kunda, who was a Tigambara philosopher whose life dates have been subject to various discussions with an unsatisfactory outcome. Um, what he does in his overall soteriological standpoint, he proclaims, according to Paul Dundas, a radical interiorization of religious life. And the soul, according to Kunda Kunda, is the only true and ultimate category in existence. And the way it is perceived in relation to the body makes the difference in the Vyavaharic and Nishchayik worldviews. And you see here one quote from his famous work, Samaya Sara, where he says, and I'm only sticking to the English translation, indeed, the Vyavaharana view says that the soul and body is one, but the view of the Nishchaya says that soul and body is not one. His work has had an important impact on the Jain lay society, and in the following, many Digambara authors claimed his lineage. By scholars, these are assembled under the term Digambara mystical tradition, and as Jerome Petit remarks in his work, ancient authors of this group tended to make a clear distinction between the two points of view, while the more recent authors maintained a more con a conventional aspect. Another important facet of the Adyatma authors is that their works are usually beyond all sectarian considerations. And I'm again quoting from Jerome Petit, who says, the self is not Digambara, neither Shvetambara, nor Shaiva, nor Vaishnava if we may say so after Yogindo, who was of course another important philosopher. Jains form a small minority within the Indian continent with only 0.41% of the overall population. Gujarat is the state where the largest number of Jains is concentrated with almost 500,000 people and where Jainism has played a vibrant role in the long history and formation of the state. Despite the fact that the Jain communities form not more than a minority of the overall population, their influence on the state and its development has been, due to the long and rich history of the Jain communities, significant. And their contributions influence the cultural and economic development of the state, and many Jain citizens actively engaged in trade, business, and industry strengthened the state's social and economic growth in supporting the state's healthcare and education systems and its social welfare. The Jain communities in Gujarat are also particularly known for their strong sense of community and philanthropy. Since Jain merchants and bankers have acted as middlemen for commercial transactions from the very beginning of the appearance of the British in India, they contributed to the success of the British colonial rule in more than just business, but also in the fields of military conquest and political dominance. Jain pioneers, having actively participating in India's industrialization since the 1860s, the time in which the British rule had been well established, later significantly contributed to building an economic sector of an independent India by demanding greater autonomy for Indian entrepreneurs and such enlarging their substantial social and economic roles, especially in metropolitan areas such as Ahmedabad. Okay, let me skip uh, the pilgrimage sites. You are all aware of those wonderful sites like Shah Turunjaya Hills and what else you find in, um, in, uh, in Gujarat. And let's turn to language. Um, Jains, according to Jain John Court, have been and are until today a highly literate community. And to understand the Jains adequately, one must read what they read. You have to understand when you deal with the texts of, uh, of Jains that Jain ideology, uh, ideology, practices and intentions are interconnected and that the texts and statements reveal ideology while practices 
are in, uh, observed and discussed. Beliefs and intentions are partly discernible through documents such as poems, novels, essays, and interviews. We go back in time. <laughs> We see that uh, in beginning with the early centuries CE, uh, Jain communities have used language as one material, uh, one material matter to distance themselves from the sacralization of a supposedly eternal Sanskrit language that was at the center of Brahman social and ritual ideology. Therefore, vernacular practices such as Arga Magadi and other developing languages from the Middle Indo-Aryan language canon have been dominant for centuries in the Jain scriptural canon. By the second millennium CE, Prakrit had become effectively standardized through the presumptions of grammars, but became increasingly divorced from popular understanding, and as such, seemed to have been a strategy to impart a degree of quasi-scriptural authenticity in the face of increasing vernacularization in the development of Sanskrit in Western India as the medium of Burgoning uh, chronicle literature. Having turned to Sanskrit, which had been cultivated especially in narrative texts, plays and hagiographic biographies from the 12th century uh, CE and flourished around the 17th century CE during the Mughal period, Jain monks produced alternative description models, descriptive models of Sanskrit grammar, such as adapting the language according to their own literary use and demands. By the 18th century, an extensive rise in numbers of literary works in Gujarati, especially uh, in, uh, in poetry deriving from Gujarati folk tales, but also used in descript uh, descriptively for hagiographies and the description of holy places, shows that on the one hand, the use of vernacular language helped to address the unlearned, but on the other hand, a bilingualism in Sanskrit Prakrit and Gujarati was to become a cultural universal among Jain renunciant intellectuals. Uh, some remarks of the Gujarati language. Gujarati is the official language of the state of Gujarat and a member of the Indo-Aryan language family. Uh, it is spoken not only by millions of people in uh, Gujarat, but also in areas of Maharashtra, Madhya Pradesh, and Rajasthan in India. Gujarati speakers also reside in many other countries, principally Pakistan, Singapore, Fiji, South Africa, the United Kingdom, the United States, and Canada. And although <clears throat> George Cardona sees a gradual diminution in its use in successive genera uh, generations. The first generation of immigrants to these places still maintains Gujarati as a family language and such underlines the importance of language as a means of identity forming. So now we will talk to uh, change <laughs> done with history and concentrate on, uh, on uh, Srimad Raj Chandra. Um, just some introductory facts about him. He was born uh, in November 18, uh, 1867 as uh, Raichand uh, Bhai, Ravich Bhai in Vavania, near uh, Morbi in Gujarat. Uh, um, his father was a Vaishnava Hindu and his mother was a Shvetambara Shtanaka, <coughs> Shtanaka Vasi Jain. Um, uh, Srimad Rajchanda died in 1901 in Rajkot. His biographies were written by his devotees and they show strong hagiographic tendencies, so it is difficult to, uh, to find reliable inform uh, information on him. But for sure, his uh, teachings have been and are today spread by followers of various Jain sectarian traditions, while its intellectual embed is largely Digambara. Court, for example, highlights that Raj Chandra was largely influenced by Digambara writing, especially by those of Kunda Kunda, while Paul Dundas points out that he came to accept image worship as a valid aid to spiritual advancement. And Dundas is also the one who stresses the influence of Hinduism in Raj Chandra's writings. Nevertheless, most, appe most appealing to his followers was his ability to write in easy to remember language. The Atma City Shastra, for example, was in fact no more than a reformulation of a more elaborate letter to a follower. And his talent to add a modern and easily digestible touch to the often dry and rather traditional Jain philosophy. 
Um, the Atma Siddhi Shastra is uh, um, Srimad Raj Chandra's most famous work, and it translates to the treatise on realizing the soul or self. It is built uh, <clears throat> around a six-fold way uh, uh, telling six truths about the soul, and we are going to look about uh, on the on those six uh, truths. It has the form of the dialogue between a guru and a di uh, disciple. And um, let's have a look what these six truths are all about. This is verse number 43, where it says that the Atman exists. Second truth is it is eternal. The third truth is it is the doer of karma, of its karma. And fourth, it is the receiver of fruits. Also, fifth, there is liberation. And in the sixth truth, the path of liberation is good dharma, sudharma we see here. And there's another verse that I would like to share with you here. It's verse number 101, 101, where it says, The Atman is eternal, consciousness, and free of all illusions, by which unity of soul, soul is attained. That is the path to liberation. And of course, uh, when reading these uh, these verses, you can feel or see the close relation that uh, uh, Srimad Rajchanda has uh, established uh, in the within the line of uh, Kundapun Kunda's uh, main teachings. When we have a look at the contemporaries of uh, Srimad Rajchandra, we see that he was uh, yeah, born into a time of great change and also of many people that have uh, yeah, have, that's, that have had an impact on uh, Indian uh, Indian history. One of those um, uh, was, of course, Mohandas Karamchand, Mahatma Gandhi, who considered, um, yeah, um, Srimad Rajchandra as one of his uh, greatest influencers. And the remark on the relationship between Srimad Rajchandra and Gandhi. Rajchandra and Gandhi met in 1891, shortly after Gandhi's return from Britain. And the relationship between the two has been exaggerated by the Jain communities, often relating to Rajchandra as Gandhi's guru. This is certainly not the case, as Gandhi himself points out in his biography. However, he still speaks of him with great admiration. And I'm quoting from Gandhi's uh, autobiography, where he says, so although I could not make Raj Raichand by the master of my heart, we shall see why I have received his shelter time and again. Suff suffice it to say here that there are three modern men who have made a deep impression on my life. Raichand Bai, by his life contact, Tolstoy by his book, by Kunt Tara Hridayam Hai, hey, and Ruskin by his book, Unto This Last Sarvodaya. There is a small booklet called Srimad Rajchandra's reply to Gandhiji's questions that illustrates the exchange between uh, the, the, the two great thinkers. Uh, this booklet does not contain more than 32 pages and it lists 70, uh, 27 questions that are attributed to Gandhi and the answers of Rajchandra to those questions. Question number 11, which I have not put on this slide, but we'll read to you now, is rather short. And the answer given consists of one single paragraph, a remarkable fact given by uh, given the importance of nonviolence for any Jain. So the question is, does any merit accrue from the sacrifice of animals or other things? And this is what uh, Srimad Raj Chandra has answered. Is there a virtue, virtue in the sacrifice of animals? The sin of killing an animal, killing it or hurting it is all the same, even if you do it in yajna or do it sitting in the presence of God. Although in yajna, the act of giving is done for a uh, meritorious purpose. However, it is also not acceptable as it involves violence. And the small section shows the tendency of religious diplomacy, which Raj Chandra utilizes so as not to scare off his readers per se, but to help them to acquire and choose from a sequence of priorities in their spiritual thinking. 
In the end, he clearly denotes the total renunciation of violence beyond all religious traditional practice. By his lifetime, Srimad Raj Chandra... Marina? Yeah? Not to rush you, but um, you have about five minutes, uh, supposedly so. Oh, and at 1846, okay. <laughs> yeah, just to, uh, yeah, to, to sum it up, by his lifetime, Srimad Rajchandra has grown a circle of devoted followers around him, including both uh, Shvetambara and Digambara Leti and several Stanaka Vasi Sadhus. Paul Dundas assumes that most Jains worldwide today would regard him as a great teacher, which can be concluded from the variety of religious centers related to him in several parts of the world on the one hand, and on the other hand, from signs that a lay guru lineage is evolving, which clearly shows the attractiveness, modernity, and appeal of his teachings beyond all sectarian and even religious borders. Let me come to the conclusion of my paper and presentation. Srimad Raj Chandra was born into a time of substantial change and renewal of all beliefs and practices to persist against the British rule, but also against the rising pressure of Hindu, Muslim and Christian competition within the social space, Jain communities and sects had taken various measures to unite their members and followers under the roof of a common Jain belief system acceptable for all. In these measures, language and the vernacular Gujarati in particular played a crucial role. The philosophy of Srimad Rajchandra, although not purely Jain by strict definition, was ex uh, excellently suited to contribute to these reform efforts through its appeal by a simplification and through the concentration of self-realization, an approach which was steadily gaining popularity in these days. And this led to a growing popularity of his teachings and resulted in a steadily growing number of Jain followers worldwide. Um, Emma Salter, in her P uh, PhD thesis, denotes the qualities of uh, the Srimad Raj uh, Chandra lay movement of today as follows. It has transferred well to diaspora communities and represents a form of Jainism that has adapted to address the changing needs of Jains in the modern world. And um, uh, there is one quotation that I would like to, uh, to give to you to finish up my, uh, my presentation. Uh, I asked one of the, uh, <laughs> of the, um, of the Atmar pits, the, uh, the, uh, the lay followers of Srimad Raj Chandra of the ashram, why did Srimad Raj Chandra choose to write in Gujarati? And he gave me a quite simple answer. He said, he gave, basically Gujarati was the prime language during his times and his education also was in Gujarati, although he of course knew many other of uh, many of the languages because of his mnemonical past. But all the devotees knew J J Gujarati, and so the devotee Pujashri Sobhagat Bai made the request to him and all the other devotees all knew Gujarati, and hence it was the primary language he had written his composition in Gujarati so people could understand. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> and I have, uh, I have. Hello, Corina. Oh. Uh, uh, yeah, here's some of my, uh, yeah, the books I used uh, to prepare this presentation. Uh, just run quickly through those. Uh, let me know or contact me if you need some more details. And thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Corina. This is a silent applause from everyone. Um, and with this, uh, we can go on to the presentation by Corinne Smith. And after that, we will do the Q&A session. Hello. Um, so I'm just going to see if I can share the screen. Um... Okay, has this worked? Okay. Um, so, um, so my talk today will argue that the absence of a monastic class um, in the uh, subsequent organizations 
and uh, their own pursuit of a path to self-realization in uh, a lay mode does not constitute an outright rejection of monkhood and the monastic path of spiritual liberation per se. Um, neither is there any contempt or animosity from Sri Madan Kanji Swami towards um, the monks as such. Um, rather, there is more nuance to this. Um, rather, I'd like to uh, posit the idea that the adoption and promotion of a path of self-realization by both Kanji Swami and Srimad Rajachandra, whereby the distinctions of monk and householder were rendered less important and instead replaced by a repositioning or a recentering upon the sources of knowledge instead. So in the case of Srimad's followers, you don't have the idealized monk, but instead you have the self-realized the true guru who becomes the privileged figure as a key to knowledge for a seeker upon this path. And for Kanji Swami, sources of knowledge for self-realization become ultimately internalized and identifiable with one's own pure soul, Atma. Although I think in the end, both would agree upon the nischaya based understanding of, of your soul being the ultimate um, source of knowledge. Um, so these knowledge-based approaches have the effect then of opening up an accessible, liberating path to a mass audience, completely bypassing monastic and householder identities and also monastic power at the same time. Um, these approaches also then have ramifications for the subsequent shape that followers organize themselves into without, of course, having the uh, usual fourfold structure uh, of a sangha. The commonalities then between Srimad Rajachandra and Kanji Swami are strikingly many. Both were born in the latter half of the 19th century into families belonging to the Srimali Dasa caste in the Shaurashtra region of Gujarat. And both, of course, found fame as uh, lay gurus teaching, um, teaching uh, upon uh, liberation of the self as their primary topic. Um, this contrasts more uh, with the more ritually focused strands of Shvetamba Multipujikas and the Stanakvasi Jainism, which was also present in their families, and that was dominant in the region at the time. Um, the goal, of course, of spiritual liberation is to, um, is to be achieved by an experiential knowledge of one's own soul, um, called Samyak Darshan. Uh, very simply put, then, this knowledge-rooted um, brand of liberating teaching um, is, is also um, known as adhyatma. Um, so one of the major shared features is the uh, conceptual category ascribed to them as founders of lay movements, commonly seen across the existing academic literature. Uh, this category of lay movement is usually given to indicate their operation outside of the standard received organizational model of the fourfold sangha, that is monks and nuns, male and female householders, as well as to indicate the absence of any institutional monastic status accorded to the two leaders. The lay status tag is underscored if we look to the connection of the teachings with the wider Adhyatma tradition going back to uh, Kunda Kunda and the uh, figures of the 16th and 17th centuries, such as Todamal and Banasidas, um, of which we can say Srimad and Kanji Swami are inheritors of. Uh, so uh, yeah, this tradition has also been characterized as largely led with figures like Banasidas and Todamal, and um, their own uh, organizations um, come to also have this uh, label. Paul Dundas has noted that the uh, Kanji Swami Pant, sorry for using the word Pant, so I know it's sometimes a little controversial, um, has, it's always been a lay movement and initiated ascetics are accorded no special status. Emma Sulta also, in her thesis, employed the term to describe the followings of Srimad Rajachandra, although it was also not without its problems, and she had to defend the use of that as uh, 
followers um, pointed out that it implied some sort of innovation on his part, uh, which of course the devotees took issue with. Um, so, however, the social identifier of uh, Shrava, of householder or layperson, is one that both the figures appear comfortable with for themselves, uh, whilst at the same time remaining respectful of the monastic ideal. Kanji Swami famously renounced his Stanak Farsi monastic vows after more than 20 years as a monk and professed himself to be a Digamba layperson albeit while maintaining some of his monkish lifestyle habits uh, pertaining to food and clothing, for example. The renunciation of his vows, coupled with his lay guru status, led to criticisms from wider Jain circles that he did not believe in or support the role of monks in general. Uh, he provides a rebuttal of this, stating that he considers himself to actually be a most faithful servant to sadhus. Elaborating, he went on to clarify that a true muni was defined according to the internal condition of the soul rather than the giving up of external possessions. Srimad Rajachandra remained a lifelong householder with a wife and children and forged a career for himself in the jewellery business. In his writing entitled Thoughts on Happiness, he describes how, although he ultimately aimed to give over responsibilities to his sons and become a forest dweller within time, he nevertheless accepted his householder status as the necessary playing out of his past karmas. And indeed, he saw his householder status as beneficial in better connecting with householders who required the most help in navigating and balancing religious matters with domestic and career-based ones, contrasting his position with those of, for example, yatis and sannyasis who had no practical experience of this. So we see that both leaders are largely at peace with their lay person status in contrast to that, of course, of the muni or the sadhu, um, who uh, traditionally embodies the higher spiritual path to liberation. Um, the repositioning of the Muni figure then reflects a, a broader preoccupation with a liberating path centered upon an individual gaining an experience of the soul. Um, so I don't have time to uh, kind of you know, replicate the exact uh, all, the, all the things, but um, it will suffice to summarize here that Samyak Darshan um, basically uh, refers to a glimpse of the soul. Um, an experience which one is ideally then able to lengthen for progressively longer and longer periods of time. Um, as consciousness and knowledge are innate characteristics of the soul, Samyak Darshan is a possibility open to all individual souls and thus distinctions of worldly social categories melt into the background and become largely irrelevant in the pursuit of the goal of experiential knowledge of the soul. <clears throat> um, of course, it should be pointed out here that the idea of a path to liberation by a Samyak Darshan is not new, as we saw with Karina's talk with um, Kunda Kunda. Um, and neither is the fact that you do not necess necessarily need to become a monk in order to achieve that. Nevertheless, these ideas were not widespread in public consciousness in Gujarat at the time, and certainly not in local languages, which Karina has also referred to. So in this sense, then, they are providing something fresh. From a casual reading of um, the materials, um, one might be inclined to think that they are teaching much the same thing um, with so much crossover, given that both figures are advocating a liberating path centered upon an individual attaining experiential knowledge of the soul, that is self-realization. The valid question arises as to how exactly they differ from one another. Although in essence, the path is indeed similar, yet they also differ in their approach to the path in an important way, which I would like to highlight here for you. They have distinct and differing attitudes towards the dissemination of this path. 
uh, particularly regarding who the audience is and whether the guru, um, whether the guidance of a guru is required or not. Kanji Swami appears to have been very open with an all are welcome kind of attitude to attendees of his lectures, uh, regardless of creed, age, or previous level of knowledge of the audience, his lectures remain consistent in the adiatmic topics he tackles, crediting each listener with the potential to grasp something at the very least from his lectures. And the everyday language and other didactic methods he uses aids in conveying those teachings. These factors no doubt contribute to consistently larger audiences um, during um, uh, at his lectures um, going down the years. Um, in contrast to this, it becomes apparent from Sriman's letters and biographical episodes that um, he's, he appears to have a, quite a concern about the potential dangers of people learning things which they are not quite yet ready for as I will show with a couple of examples. And these concerns are perhaps in part why he dwells upon the topic of the guru as a seeker's guide, a guide who has already walked this path and gained self-realization for themselves. So hopefully you'll see these kind of contrasting attitudes in the following examples. So Srimad states the benefits of a self-realized guru to guide one's path to self-realization. And he dedicates a chapter to discern the false guru from the true guru in his text upon self-realization entitled The Atma Siddhi. Uh, in her thesis, Emma Salter notes this emphasis upon the need for a true guru in this work. Re referencing verse number 135, uh, she says, in concluding the text, Srimad identifies the soul as having the inherent quality for moksha, but states that this can only, uh, I emphasize only here, um, be realized by the application of the instrumental cause, the instruction of a true guru. Now, the verse itself does not state this in so strong terms. It doesn't say the only um, uh, instrumental cause can be a guru. But Srimad's uh, commentators appear to have taken it um, a little bit further uh, by insisting upon the absolute need for an external true guru. Um, the instrumental cause for moksha is further explained by Brahmacharyji Govardhan Dasji uh, in his commentary as a uh, twofold. Strict adherence to the instructions of an enlightened living guru and meditation upon that liberated state as explained by that guru. Uh, in his commentary on the uh, following verse 136, he warns us that to focus upon the primary cause or the, the upadan only, uh, that is the liberating uh, capabilities of the soul itself. Um, uh, if you dispense with the instrumental cause of the guru's guidance, um, with no one to correct your mistakes, this will inevitably lead to further entanglement for the soul in its samsaric wandering and self-realization then becomes an impossibility. Um, this interpretation strikes me as uh, fairly extreme um, and insisting upon the need for one very specific instrumental cause like this is also not in keeping with um, um, other um, writers um, other in, in uh, the Adiatmic tradition. Um, <clears throat> so Rara, I think the verse... Oh, sorry, I should show you the verse. <laughs> um, rather, I think that the verses should be taken in the following way. That um, Shrima did not intend to suggest that one self-realization um, self realization hinges solely upon uh, getting a true guru. Um, of course, there are useful um, nimits, but a nimit um, of self-realization can technically, theoretically be anything. Um, it does not need to be a guru as such. Um, so, um, yeah, uh, of course, a guru is a very useful, helpful nimit to have, but not the only supporting factor, um, which um, appears to be the suggestion made by his commentators. 
Um, so um, rather we um, should take these verses together um, as a warning um, to uh, be wary of the attitude of the uh, Nishchaya Bashis, uh, the ones who look only at the Nishchaya um, and who uh, become complacent, relying upon the soul's own potentiality for moksha to come about by itself, uh, which he then goes on to talk about. Um, so returning to um, examples of Srimad's uh, cautious attitude then. So this anxiety over a spiritual seeker entering upon this path unguided is also visible in the circumstances around the Atma City's composition itself, uh, which reveals that the text was never really intended by Srimad for wider public consumption. Um, I think Karina mentioned, um, uh, touched upon this a little. Um, so according to his biographers, the composition of the Atma Siddhi uh, was requested um, by Srimad's close associate and devotee, So Bhagbhai, um, with its verses encapsulating the teachings and acting as a memory aid. Um, However, upon its completion, um, Srimad asked Ambalal, who we see um, here with the lamp, uh, also another one of his close devotees. Um, so he asked Ambalal to make only um, four copies of this manuscript of the Atma Siddhi. So uh, one was to be given to Sobagbai, one for Ambalal himself, one for Zaveribai, and one for Laguraj. So um, the introduction to the Agas edition describes how Shrima told Lagaraj to study and contemplate the contents of the Satma Siddhi alone and to not make it a subject of collective reading or public discourse. Um, so again, I think this kind of, um, this careful concern uh, is evident here. It tallies with another episode um, featured in Srimad's biographies, whereby a group of followers had borrowed some letters written by Srimad, and they wanted to make copies of them as they contained some religious instructions. However, they were not the intended recipient of those letters. Upon finding out about this, Srimad reprimands the group and destroys the copies they had made. This instance, uh, these instances to get, uh, taken together with Shima's advice to follow a self-realized guru's instruction suggests to me that he had quite an intense anxiety about the potential pitfalls or dangers that this liber uh, liberating path poses for the uninitiated spiritual aspirant. Misunderstandings about the nature of the soul and its liberation would constitute mityatva. Uh, rendering the individual soul in a worse state than before by developing strong convictions rooted in such false beliefs. So naturally, he uh, makes sense that he does not want to uh, cause such a scenario to develop. Um, Kanji Swami, on the other hand, appears to be far more optimistic and confident in his attitude towards his audiences. Uh, in 1977, Kanji Swami gave an interview to his longtime devotee and respected scholar, uh, Dr. Hukum Chan Parel, um, the, uh, the transcript of which was later published under the title Chaitanya Chamatka. Playing devil's advocate here, Baril asked Kanji Swami to address a range of criticisms that had been leveled against him from various factions within the wider Jain community. One particular question and response is quite revealing about Kanji Swami's attitude towards sharing adhyatmic teachings with a mass audience. The question is posed, when matters of Atma are so fine and subtle, how much understanding will 20,000 people realistically gain? Kanji Swami responds thus. Um, oh. Yeah. Um, why won't anything come of it? All beings are Atma, they are Bhagavan. When an eight-year-old child can get a Samyak Darshan, then perhaps not a perfectly correct understanding, but something will come of it. That's why I come to lecture every day. So my language is simple. That state is definitely difficult, 
but without understanding that state, there is no kalyana. Um, I've translated it here as spiritual upliftment, but um, yeah, maybe someone can suggest. Um, what should I do? I have this very thing. This is about getting rid of samsara. Without this happening, there is no kalyana. So here we see he appeals to the soul's inherent nature. Uh, it's innate ability to know as a means of justification for disseminating a diatma to a mass audience. And again, he's also using uh, Gujarati, much like Srimad Rajachandra does, using this simple everyday language that people can understand. So, um, so this attention to the role of a true guru then, which we might say is a characteristic feature um, of the um, kind of more Vyavaharic um, approach to the path that Srimad describes. And this stands in contrast to Kanji Swami promoting a more nischaya understanding um, upon the guru. Um, in a lecture on the second verse of the Samayasara, he addresses the question of whether or not the triad of Dev Shastra Guru is Swadravya or Paradravya. That is, is it of one's own substance or not? And he gives the response emphatically that Dev Guru Shastra is Paradravya, completely separate and other. And as such, you should not become reliant upon it. Unhappiness and further su suffering is the result of reliance upon another substance in the long run and a far cry from the reality of your Atma's independent nature. Perfected Samyak Darshan, Gyan and Charitra occurs within your Atma and Dev Shastra Guru cannot do that for you, only Atma can. So it is important to see then that on the Nischaya level of understanding, Srimad Rajachandra and Kanji Swami do actually ultimately agree. Um, it's just um, Kanji Swami actually quotes Srimad when describing the Atma as Param Guru uh, in a lecture. Thus, they both identify the ultimate Guru with one's own independent soul. It is just that Srimad's approach in the Atma City was more cautious and he amends his teachings to suit the needs of the recipient by using more Vyavaharic language where required so that the student did not make any errors. So whether one needs an external guru or not or relies upon the internal one, um, one's Atma in pursuit of attaining self-realization, even the possibility of becoming a Samyat Drishti in this lifetime as a lay person is still debated in wider Jain circles. The Digamba Mulsanga, for example, deny this to be possible, and they claim the only one who has taken initiation as a Digamba Muni can get Samyat Darshan. So despite these critical debates, this has not seemed to have dampened the popularity of these lay Adiyatma movements. If anything, their popularity appears to be increasing and the growth of numbers of followers, infrastructures and wider global reach speak to the enduring appeal of a path to self-realization outside of a monastic framework. Um, so I'd like to leave you um, with these words from Kanji Swami, the experience of Atma is the main thing and the purpose of human existence is only in the experience of Atma. Um, okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Corinne, for this, this very enriching uh, talk, very, um, how to say, the two talks, went together very well. Um, so that's also a good thing of this panel. Well done. Um, and I invite everyone to give a round of applause uh, as I see my colleagues doing already. A virtual applause uh, will be, we'll, we'll do that. So with that, um, we can go now to the Q and A. Um, there are already two questions. Um, besides a few comments from, from our audience. And I invite uh, everyone in the audience to, to add to those questions. Um, I think they will simulate our discussion, simulate uh, the thought processes of, of our two uh, panelists here. So, so feel free to do that. 
Um, but I'll start with a question that Steve Foes has asked, and that is the following for Corina. He writes, thanks for the great talk, Corina. Um, did Sri Madhraj Chandra compose in any language other than Gujarati? What can we know about his, about his knowledge of Sanskrit or Prakrit? Biographies seem to suggest that he had little need for English, considering um, the commercial and social circles in which he operated. Do you have reason to believe otherwise? Thank you for the great question. And no, I do not have any reason to believe otherwise when his English is concerned. Um, especially when we uh, take a look at, well, we, we do have an, an eyewitness of his English uh, knowledge, which uh, who is, of course, Gandhi in his autobiography, when he talks about meeting uh, Srimad Rajchandra for the first time. And we have to uh, yeah, to take into account that uh, Raj Chandra was only 24 years old by that time. Um, he was uh, practicing a um, performance of Avadhana. That's a, a memory retention and recollection test. And uh, uh, Raj Chandra was introduced to Gandhi by, you know, his great mnemonic uh, uh, capabilities. And he said, you can talk to him Raj Chandra in a language he does not know, and he will repeat it. Um, and so Gandhi talked to Raj Chandra in English because uh, Raj Chandra did not know English, and he repeated it uh, without any any mistakes, which uh, greatly uh, astonished uh, Gandhi. So we know that at least by the age of twenty four years old, Srimad Raj Chandra did not know English at all. And he obviously did not know it, uh, need it in, in his circles and also later on. Um, he did compose um, uh, some works in Hindi, uh, despite of Gujarat, as far as I know, or as far as I had, had researched. I'm not aware of uh, compositions in any other languages. Uh, I do think that he must have had a solid knowledge in the classical languages because he, of course, was familiar with the teachings of the great Jain philosophers that also are reflected in his work. And I hope this answers the question. Great, great question. Thank you. Thanks for this. Thank you for that, Corina. Um, to switch speakers, I'll now go to the second question by Steve to Corinne. Um, he asks the following, and he says uh, he congratulates you as well with your talk, to be sure. Um, but he asks, what do you see as not present in um, the concerns of Sri Matraj Chandra and Kanji Swami that we see in more mainstream Jain traditions? How might you, might you compare their Adhyatma approach to, say, Banarsidas? Okay, so um, I think that... Um... Uh, sorry, the question, just to clarify, it's about, you know, um, this concerns that Srimad has these kind of anxieties, right? Sorry, can you repeat that? Uh, yeah, sorry, I was just saying, can you just um, repeat the question for me? Just to clarify, he's asking about these um, anxieties or concerns Srimad Rajachandra has and whether those are present in other mainstream uh, yeah, so Steve Foes um, is asking um, whether, um, to rephrase it perhaps, you know, their ideas um, and their concerns, uh, do we see something specific that we see, um, that we not see, don't see, in more mainstream Jain traditions? And um, then how does it compare to Banarshidas? Okay, well, I mean, I can speak to um, certainly the other kind of mainstream Jain traditions. There certainly, of course, um, has always been a, a, a kind of uh, esoteric knowledge or, you know, not certain uh, things that have only uh, been shared really for like monks or, or, or nuns or, you know, persons who have had, uh, you know, a, a, a kind of firm grounding in uh, all of the scriptures first and, and you know you need to have uh, a certain level of progression spiritually in order to um, you know access this this kind of um, teachings and you know, these kinds of things are there um, 
So, I mean, I think um, that um, with Kanji Swami now, I kind of feel that he um, kind of uh, kind of lifts the lid on everything and says, well, no, we, we don't need to be to be so cautious that um, actually, um, you know, give credit where credit's due. Everyone is Atma, so therefore uh, everyone has the potential to, to, to understand these things. Um, people often shy away from them as, as, as being too difficult to understand or, or, or too abstract or, or whatever. Um, so, um, I mean, of course, this functions uh, on a couple of levels, uh, not just um, for the uh, kind of students' protection, as, as we might see, but also, um, traditionally speaking, it was a, a way of, you know, kind of holding power um, and maintaining that, if you see with the, and certainly in the kind of Degamba tradition, um, that's very much present. So, um, I mean, I guess figures like Banasidas were a real threat to the established um, um, Sangha in that respect, that they were kind of, again, kind of, you know, opening Pandora's box and letting it all out, um, which is something that the, um, you know, obviously the Bataraxan were kind of mm, guarding, um, you know, scriptures and things and uh, had a tight grip on those things. So, um, yeah, um, certainly it's something of like a kind of almost I can say like a I guess a uh, a kind of open access I guess you know like let's not put any paywalls over it um, a kind of democratization of 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 the knowledge that that is is there and uh, yeah um, I kind of feel that these uh, help it does help to kind of break down um, established structures that were there before that had maintained power uh, and of course then the people who come along and do that are then seen as a threat and receive criticism as such because they are threatening those power structures in place sometimes they're more successful than others um, I think these Laody Artmic movements are incredibly successful so um, yeah I hope that kind of goes some way to answering that question Thank you. If, if I may add a small comment that Steve also uh, added is what is the question um, why Sri Madhurachandra and Kanji Swami are so interested in moksha and not in other things that uh, are also part of gene uh, ideology. Sure. Um, okay. So, um, I mean, for them, that's that's really that that's all there is. Um, I think Kanji Swami um, and I'm not sure about Srimad, but certainly Kanji Swami um, had explained that he doesn't talk about things related to um, to conduct or um, kind of the standard kind of householder rules of, of conduct because uh, he assumes everyone is familiar with that anyway. Um, they people were doing the rituals. People are doing. You, they they know what they're doing. You know, we don't need to talk about that. Um, uh, secondly, uh, that those things do not impact uh, on, on the path to moksha. You know, they, um, they, they, those things, are, they create an auspicious state for you, but ultimately they don't have any real effect upon your progression towards moksha. Um, so why they don't then talk about these kind of things, such as I assume he means things like fasting or uh, dan and things like this, um, because it's inconsequential really to your soul. Um, so that would be the reason, um, I guess, why I'm not sure about uh, if Srimad said anything directly, maybe Karina can enlighten us, I'm not sure. Um, okay, uh, Karina, I'll, you can answer to this, but I also give you another question. Um, both uh, Samani Shashi Pragya and Shweta Jain, um, question or ask you why you alluded to the fact or why you said that um, Srimad Rajan's philosophy is not purely Jain. Yeah, <laughs> because it's, uh, yeah, that's a little bit provoking. I'm, I'm sorry for this. And of course, uh, of course, he is Jain and his philosophy is Jain. But um, I wanted to stress the fact that he, of course, um, reacted to influences that were that he found around uh, in in his surroundings, 
And um, I mean, um, he, his father was a Vaishnava Hindu, so he was used to this uh, language apparently in a in a way that that made Paul Dundas stress uh, the influence of Hinduism in his writings in saying he talked about God in the idiom of Vaishnava theism. So there is there are those influences, but of course, um, uh, what 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 uh, Srimad Radha Chandra did is was he incorporated. Um, um, these ideas to to form uh, to form uh, to form a philosophy that was uh, influenced by other uh, other other streams or strengths, but still, of course, it was pure. Uh, it was Jain. So you, I cannot say that it is not purely Jain, but it was, of course, those influences that are definitely in in his works. Um, I think this is what uh, was what Raj Chandra's big talent was to make uh, the the philosophy that that, uh, that was rooted deeply in in you see how long the tradition was that he, that he that he that he re uh, recorporated uh, to make these things accessible to his followers. That was one of his largest talents to really give them a language they could understand, a language that spoke directly to them, that made all these things easier for them to understand. And if there was a use of uh, maybe Hindu language, uh, then of course it was a language that was in use during that time. It was the, the, the language of the everyday people in the everyday streets because these people were the ones that uh, that that could be uh, yeah that could be influenced by it and that could that could be spoken to it and yeah making this accessible to to so many people um that was one of his greatest uh, of, of of his greatest uh, of his greatest talents i'd say and and we see this in this uh, growing popularity of his teachings today even uh, not only in gujarat but uh, uh, also in those uh, in, in in the communities abroad in the diaspora so i hope i could clarify this a little bit don't be offended <laughs> i'm a scientist I'm, I'm i need to i need to yeah sometimes uh, Can i add one more point to that as well um just to say that um you know in samaya sara that also shows evidence of engaging with a number of different um, philosophical religious ideas as well. So I guess, you know, it's incomplete really to uh, uh, um, to not engage with, you know, other ideas that will be outside Jainism, um, you know, Buddhist, Vedanta, et cetera, et cetera, is all present and engaged with. Um, so really he's just continuing on, uh, like you say, this idea of tradition anyway. Yes. And you're finding this in many texts, and I'm I'm researching a Jain text on yoga, and it's uh, it's so amazing what what you find uh, in uh, what has been incorporated into this uh, into this text. And yeah, I can only refer to the the one uh, quote that I that I that I brought uh, in slide number three. It was that um, Yogindo was quoted in saying that the self is not Digambara, neither Shritambara, nor Shaiva or Vaishnava. That all is. Uh, uh, yeah, we have a universal approach, a universal approach in uh, in the philosophy of uh, of Rimad Raj Shanna. and this yeah, this makes it so special, I think, and so also so successful. Also, can I myself ask a question to both of you then, because it really links in with with what you just all explained. Um, you have this open and universal approach um, at the same time. With Srimatrach at the same time, Corinne um, pointed out how Srimatrach Chandra's writing um, were a bit more wary of uh, a non specialized uh, audience. Um, I mean, with regards to the possibility of, of Semek Darshan, etc. Um, so, my question would be if there is a potential of conversion in in his texts, uh, and also whether, you know, if you talk about Nishay, et cetera, whether the broader non-Jain audience would be uh, conversant enough in those terms to, to be able to be spoken to. Um, so what would you both say to that? You want to go first? Or... <laughs> 
I'm not really. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. Um, so, um, yeah, I think that's a really wonderful question and is certainly very pertinent towards the uh, Kanji Swami tradition, this topic of um, conversion. And um, so, I mean, obviously, um, when he first started out as a monk, um, he was used to giving public lectures and all. Um, and then obviously when he uh, left the monkhood and declared himself, um, you know, converted from Stanak Basi to Digamba, to get Digamba lay person, um, what happened was, of course, um, you you got, of course, a, 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 you know, an, an outcry, basically, a small riot <laughs> took place. But uh, the aftermath of that was the result that uh, a lot of the people who left with him, who uh, remained and uh, uh, kind of stuck by him, these were all uh, essentially Stanak Varsis who had converted um, and uh, as reflects the demographic of the area that he was operating in at the time. Um, and I can imagine perhaps the same is true for streamers. Uh, and then similarly, even now, um, you know, so it, certainly in London, I think uh, maybe Tina is uh, aware of this stuff with her work with the uh, the um, with the Janes there in London. Um, but they will tell you that they all uh, had no idea about this until about uh, the seed started being planted around 1980 in London. And they were all Deravasis, you know, they, they were all just going to the temple in, in the standard kind of Shvetamba way. And um, they, um, upon hearing uh, a visiting lecturer, then uh, you had this kind of mass um, uh, conversion happen almost um, amongst the people who were attending uh, lectures at this um, Oswald Centre um, in London. Um, so the power of, of conversion in, in the, certainly in the oral material of Kanji Swami um, is definitely there again, because the language use is so accessible. Um, he will use not only the, he'll use the technical term for sure, but then he'll also use five or six, you know, different Desi words as well. And he's speaking in like this Katiawadi dialect of Gujarati. So it's not even, even a formal uh, Gujarati even, you know, it's very much of, of the, um, of the um, uh, common people. Um, so, so, so yeah, um, definitely it lends itself to, to conversion in that way. Um, so when I say, so just to clarify that when I say that Srimad has this kind of um, wariness towards, um, you know, um, um, teachings coming out before before they're ready for certain people, I mean that um, if you look across his letters, for example, um, he will amend what he's saying depending on who he's writing to um, and because he knows him. So it's almost like a tailor-made lecture or, or, you know, lesson for the person um, he's writing to like that. Um, and again, just to avoid the pitfalls perhaps of, of, of a misunderstanding. So, um, yeah, that's, that's what I mean. Uh, yeah, Karina. I actually do not have very much to add to this. Uh... Uh, except for that, uh, yeah. Basically, this, this is what a what a what a good teacher. What what makes a good teacher? That's it's really, a, yeah. Finding the means that really are suitable for this one pupil student he is talking to at the very moment. Yeah, and that's a, that's a great talent. And Thank you. Yeah. Um, there's a, a question from Alba uh, Alba Rodriguez Juan. She asks you, Corina. In the second verse you shared in a PowerPoint from the Atma Siddhi, you included a picture of what looked like women cooking. Yes. What's the reason <laughs> for that? Actually, that was uh, that I, I really loved this picture and uh, <laughs> I uh, uh, I'd wanted to illustrate a little bit more from uh, bring in a little bit more of the atmosphere of the ashram and uh, this uh, this uh, ashram in, in Dharampur, they are uh, not only, you know, a community in themselves, but they also have a, a lot of uh, impact in the uh, in the uh, society that lives around them and they have lots of pride 
projects to uh, to um, yeah to to educate and to to perform and to to help the people in the region and one of those projects that we visited and and, and saw that was those women there who are trained to do their own business in producing uh, incense sticks and what they are doing is they are preparing those uh, uh, those incense um um after and afterwards it will be cooked and uh, being put into into ovens and and uh, yeah it's it's amazing uh, to see how um yeah how how those uh, how those those women and uh, are being empowered by by those people in this in, in the ashram and yeah there was no specific reason there's no connection to the verse but uh, i just love the picture and uh, yeah I, I try to make my presentation a little bit more visual <laughs> Talking about Su Dharma, the, the good Dharma, the good tradition, the good religion. Um, Thank you, Karina. I, yes, I have I have a question for Karina as well, if you don't mind. Go ahead. Um, so um I wondered about um so you said your work focuses on Rakesh Bai in Dharampur. Um, so obviously there are, um, you know, a, a few different um, centers. Um, uh, not everybody um, acknowledges uh, uh, Rakesh Bai and, um, or at least accepts him as, as their guru. Have you um, in, um, engaged with any of the um, other groups um, at all who um, have uh, their uh, follow other gurus or even don't follow any guru at all as well? Um, no, I haven't. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, so we, we had three, three days that we spent in this ashram and uh, we really traveled a lot to see so lots of the projects uh, that were quite influential. And uh, we had some discussions uh, that, uh, yeah, that per pertain to, to other things that we thought for us were quite, uh, um, uh, yeah, yeah. As if of interest, so so we spent lots of hours talking to to women, to nuns, uh, because you know, just to mention it, one of uh, one of our fellow students, she had her, uh, yeah, she she had her period, and she was not allowed to go to the temple, and that, uh, and she was also set separately uh, for for dinner for the for the meals and that has uh, had has uh, yeah that has led to to first some distractions and then really some 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 also sad feelings of course and then uh, led to uh, very fruitful discussions and exchange between the women because we we met very educated women in this ashram one who was a was a was a doctor herself and uh, yeah it's, it's too bad we did not make more of those talks because we really came together with this these women so that was most of the the contents we had uh talking so and i i need to say that that was in 2019 and i i did not have the background to ask questions con uh, on that level also it was my first encounter encounters with the uh, jane philosophy <laughs> yeah thank you there is a a question also from um chris here so i'll let him speak oh sure Thank you. To add on to that question, uh, I was also wondering for both of you, if either of you have considered or looked at or spoken to anyone at the Agas Ashram, for example, which is kind of a, a counterpoint, you could say, to Dharampur. Uh, it's a smaller community, but a uh, living and thriving community who follows Sri Maharaj Chandra, you know, reads his Gujarati readings, is based in Gujarat, but there's also people in the diaspora who belong or, you know, have, have interfaced with the Agas Ashram within the Jain community. So I was wondering, and if you haven't, I thought it might be another good resource to kind of uh, compare these different approaches to Srimad, you know, on the ground, ethnographically, anthropologically. Okay, um, Corina, maybe? Yeah, since I have not visited, uh, there's nothing I can add to this, but I can, of course, uh, take into into account this for further research. And it sounds like a like a very interesting thing to do. Thank you, Chris. Rodin, have you had uh, contacts with the Agas Ashram? I've been to Koba, um, but not Agas. Um, although I think that Chris's point is um, um, very useful. Um, I would add to that um, the community at Saila as well, because they have this 
uh, very quite different, um, I guess, uh, approach because they have this uh, beach gyan meditation and they have a whole lineage of gurus there as well, completely separate from um, Rakesh Bhai and the Dharampur group. So I think it'd be a really interesting point of, of comparison and a nice chance to update on the situation uh, that Salter had described from, um, obviously she did her thesis in like 2001 or something. So it's been 20 years. So no doubt things have, have progressed and, and moved on and changed since then. So, yeah. So thank you. Um, we do have a few more minutes left. So I'll go on asking a question from uh, Pankaj um, Bordoloi. I hope I pronounced his name correctly. Um, the second question, uh, I'll go first. So he asks um, if Kanji Swami has done a discussion uh, about how to experience Atma through Karma. Sorry, how to experience Atma, atma through, through karma. karma? Through Karma? Yeah. Or maybe uh, a discussion of Karma in general. Um. Okay, I'm not quite sure I understand exactly. Um, uh, means that like if he's just what, what is he saying? Like the role of karma is in in experiencing your atma or something like this. Or I, I suppose so. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um. So um. I mean, he credits um. So. Uh. So for example, uh, a muni. Um, for him is um, again like I mentioned uh, uh, defined by for him the condition of the soul so if you're oscillating between the sixth and seventh Gunastan, um and um, so um, I know he certainly has said things like um, if you get some Darshan and you're able to experience your soul and remain within your soul for longer and longer periods of time uh, this is what allows for the acceleration of um of of karmic uh, um bondage and fruition um so uh for example if if i step, step on an ant uh i will get the karma for it you know but um if a muni does the same they will experience that karma much quicker uh the the binding and everything and the speed it will be much much uh, less compared with me because their soul is at a different um kind of you know uh condition to mind basically like that um so he so he does talk about this but of course um he's the, this is the you know dravya karma as opposed to um you know the the kind of bow karma um and so for kanji swami he focuses much much more on on vitrag vani uh, um, um on vitrag um on on being passionless and 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 the the bow karma side of things as opposed to dravya karma which he sees merely as the result of those passions um so um yeah so when you are considering um self-realization and liberation you need to be focused much more about um the sorry um about bow karma instead um yeah the ideas about um ah, sorry um about uh, uh uh yeah dravya karma being being the result basically that you uh should not need to focus on too much bow karma is the, the thing to focus on yeah. okay thank you um i think we have time for one more question if i'm not mistaken um so i'll have to choose one <laughs> from those that are left over uh sorry about that uh, I suggest you to write to our speakers if you if you want to learn more um but i'll take take the question of bhar doshi also for putting i hope you hear me by the way it's been it started heavily raining um so he he asks uh, the following he says kanji swami says that um the cause of not attaining moksha is both punya and papa and then he asks what about people who do not perform punya sorry what about people who do not perform, perform punya? punya so if punya is not a cause for moksha what about if you do perform ah, punya? okay yeah yeah um you know what he he says you know like carry on doing your 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 you know 
vandans and your pujas and your fasting all of these things are, are you know they're they're auspicious they're good they will get you um shubbal, you know uh, an auspicious state which is great and if that's all you can do great fine carry on doing that um you know um it's better to have your mind focused on religious things uh in that way if you can't you know dedicate yourself to you know six hours of meditation on your soul every day come with everyone who's got jobs um you know so carry on doing that and that's great um but you should understand that while you're doing that 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 really you should be trying your best to to shift the focus and attention towards your atma so if you're doing your your you know your puja in the temple you should be looking at um you know the multi with the idea that this is embodying my own perfected qualities of soul for example and things like this um so so it's not that he's against punya or thing uh, merit making as such just that it doesn't really impact in the larger goal of of uh, liberation is all but i mean having said that uh there's a, a thriving puja scene in sungar and they do uh temple worship every day um and he also um you know um famously uh consecrated loads of temples and um so um there's a big temple culture um, um there as well um so yeah that's um definitely not to say that he's anti-puja or anything like this yeah i hope that answers something thank you um and then uh, to wrap up this session i would like to ask uh, the audience to give another applause to our speakers and then i will hand over the final word to chris miller again Yes, thank you. Thank you to our speakers. And it was really a wonderful event. And uh, our first event to kick this off, I just wanted to briefly point out, because some people have been asking about it in the chat, that the agenda, the future agenda for this Dialogues in European Jain Studies event is up and available, and you can register for all of the events now. You can scroll through here, look at all the events, and just click register now for each one. They're each their own individual webinar, so you have to register for each one. We don't want to just mail you all of them. So pick the ones you'd like to attend. We'd love to see you at all of them. Uh, we will also send out these registration links in our future newsletter to you all, and we would love to see you again. And we once again thank you for coming to the first event in Dialogues in European Gene Studies, and we'll see you all in the future very soon. Bye-bye, everyone. <laughs>